Hello, sorry, yeah, we've got a complicated, um, only one person can control the slide, so you'll be getting a lot of next slide for this bit. So thank you to the organisers for this chance to speak today, um, to give you a bit of an introduction, and this is the next slide, Mark. Um, I will speak first on behalf of humankind, the humankind who process archives, to try to give you a bit of insight into the sort of form of processing that humans take. Um, and then Mark will speak on behalf of machine kind, um, to give you a bit of insight into the type of processing that um, machines undertake. And then we're going to kind of end with a plea for greater interspecies understanding and also to ask these questions about the extent to which these two forms of processing are analogous or complementary. So the next slide. Um, let's start then with humankind, humankind of the archivist kind um, and the processing that they do in preparing archival materials for use. So this processing can be very mechanical, it can be literally removing paper clips, but it can also involve quite an intellectually complex analysis, um, which is akin according to Heather McNeil to the process of compiling a scholarly edition. So there have been other attempts to characterize this process, and there are some of these on the slide, but it's often characterized as a process of sense making, of reasoning over records, of drawing conclusions and inferences on the base of evidence. And obviously that's all shaped by cultural and social forces. So this reflection on the process has also led, calls, um, led to calls for archivists from archivists and others to explain and account for their processing better, to sort of set out the rationale behind their decisions, to use footnotes and citations, and also perhaps to include things like positionality statements or to explain where they're coming from and put those in their finding aids. So in many ways, um, archivists are being asked to sort of act a bit more like researchers. So the first point I'm making is that archivists and researchers do share a lot of common ground. They both undertake reasoning over records. That said, the sort of reasoning and the processing that archivists undertake has tended to be consigned to the pre in the processing. Um, and archivists have been kind of complicit in this positioning. So the idea is that the archivists do the pre-processing before the proper processing is undertaken by the researchers. And like I say, we've been complicit in that, um, but we've also been very good at complaining about it. So the next slide, please, Mark. Um, the other point of common ground, perhaps, between archivists and researchers, humanities researchers, is that they've both spent uh, many, many years, very long history of kind of grappling with the reinvention of their processing in the light of kind of the oncoming of digital material and digital techniques. So on this slide, you've got a kind of um, some similarities, perhaps, in the trajectories that they have taken. Perhaps research has moved a bit quicker. Um, but I think perhaps research has moved a bit quicker because the other thing is that another difference I see is that humanities researchers have perhaps had a bit more luxury at seeing this as a um, an opportunity. Um, and whereas archivists have always and still do feel it constantly as a threat, as an ever growing pressure, um, you know, in research, the old ways are to some extent still tenable, but they are just not tenable anymore in archives. And this is feeling as a kind of intense pressure on archivists. So next slide, please. Um, even though sort of, you know, researchers have perhaps been able to feel it a little bit more as an opportunity, they have nonetheless started to kind of reflect on their own process, the scholarly process, and the kind of processing that they do over archives. And perhaps most famously of all, there's Unsworth scholarly primitives, which is um, one of the ways in which this has happened. Um, and this kind of looking at their process has been sort of motivated quite a lot by this idea to sort of break down the process in order to sort of build the right infrastructures and the right tools to support it. So that's kind of been one of the motivations behind this reflection. But the other is perhaps more about mapping. There's a kind of um, aim in this kind of breaking down the process and thinking through the process to kind of gain some control over what's sort of becoming quite an amorphous and emergent area of activity. So next slide, Mark, thank you. Um, as well as those kind of attempts that I've just mentioned, there have been other attempts that have perhaps focused less on taxonomy. Um, and there are two on this slide. The first is the um, attempt to create a conceptual model of the scholarly process. And the second is a more explicit mapping exercise that was undertaken by Willard, McCarty and Harold Short. So the first of these takes us at that conceptual level back to these ideas I was raising right at the start about reasoning of sort of developing and referring to propositions. And the second seeks to draw together a multiplicity of disciplines and applications into some kind of coherence 
around what is described as a methodological commons, a methodological commons, which ultimately consists of data practices, data modeling, data structures. So for humankind then, archivists and researchers alike, the common ground of their processing can be characterized perhaps at the conceptual level in terms of sense making, of drawing inferences from evidence, or if you prefer data, and at the more practical end as data practices. And what joins us and the vast majority of what we are doing with AI at the moment is actually just automating the extracting and structuring of data. So there is not a lot of automated reasoning, or as I've just learned to call it, good old fashioned artificial intelligence going on. And here I hand over to Mark. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so the um, I'm going to break down AI into, into four um, components, knowledge, reasoning, decisions, and learning. Um, now, before I make a sweeping statement that we're only doing two of these, um, and some of the talks earlier might suggest we might be touching on a third one, um, I thought I'd do a trawl of the, the literature. So I um, did a very unscientific uh, crawl of um, some search results for AI, machine learning, and cultural heritage uh, from the ACM, and I pulled out um, all, all the common keywords and phrases out of that. Um, I've then kind of summarised them into what um, I, I see as generally what we're doing with AI. We're taking large amounts of data, we might do some text recognition, we extract entities, we do some NLP, um, and then we create some linked data, data sets, and um, if we're lucky, stick a, an access system over the top. And we're using the tools of data mining and um, machine learning to enable us to do that. Um, so we're kind of ticking the boxes of knowledge and learning, um, but reasoning not so much. Um, say so Mathieu um, covered that a little bit, um, and decisions, not, not so much either. Um, now, AI has come a long way um, since the 1960s, um, when uh, Hubert Dreyfus described a chess program as playing a stupid game, and machine learning was struggling with um, uh, sort of making sense of context and ambiguity in text. Um, roll forwards sort of 45, 50 years, we've got computers um, beating world champions at, Af Alpha at Go, um, and machine translation starting to hit kind of human levels in um, some, some uh, aspects. But we still have um, machine learning uh, researchers describing their field as alchemy um, and the state of the art language generator being described as completely mindless. Um, and I think part of our um, problem, we have a lot of expectations of AI, um, and this comes down to kind of anthropomorphizing the machines. Um, so we talk about, um, we have intelligences right there in the name of it, um, neural networks and um, conjure images of some kind of silicon brain um, that is learning um, from our data. And um, even the algorithm, we um, talk about it as if it's some kind of sentient being. And I want to just unpick more of those last two um, words on the list there. Um, so we talk a lot about algorithms and models. First kind of model is really a model of our data um, and we apply different kinds of architectures, that uh, might be a better word for, um, depending on our data, whether it's, we can fit a line through it, whether it's image data or some kind of sequential data like text um, or speech. Once we've chosen our model for the, for the problem, for the data that we're working with, um, we then build a, um, a sort of actual representation of that model of physical representation, which is might be a neural network like this one. And what's important, we heard earlier from Giorgio as well, is this is just a mathematical function. It maps a, a numerical input to numerical output. Um, and it uses some kind of linear algebra in the middle, multiplying matrices and passing them through functions that look a bit like these squiggles to the right of the plus sign. Um, the output that we get is a, is a number, usually between zero and one, or a list of numbers between zero and one. And we interpret that as a probability. The model itself has no idea that we're trying to classify blue or orange. It just gives us a number we interpret. If it's above a half, then we say it's blue. And if it's below a half, we say it's classified as orange. Um, what we see in this um, sort of spiral image here is that my training data of orange and blue dots, um, the function has fit um, something to that and successfully classified them. Um, what's interesting, I think, is that if we look at the, the corners of the image, the uh, you can see from the train data, there's absolutely no good reason why we should think either of the extremes of those image are orange or blue. 
but the function just takes whatever numbers we put in and it will return something. It's, there's a boundary there between, you can see between the blue and orange. And again, that doesn't really exist in the, in the model. It's just the point where the probability flips favoring one, one result more than another in our interpretation. Um, the algorithm bit to me is the bit that actually does the work of filling in that matrix with the numbers. And all it really does is try to get all the numbers in the matrix to a point where we get, it makes fewer, em fewer errors than if we used any of the different numbers. Um, it's mapping features from our documents to whatever classification we've given each record, um, but it's just a minimizing problem. To pick an actual model, we generally pick the one which has the best um, score against some kind of benchmark, irrespective of whether that benchmark data has anything to do with the problem we're trying to solve. Um, so I just wanted to sort of go through a sort of more concrete example of um, using the kind of uh, text recognition or NLP. So we start off by representing our data in some numerical form, our text. The simplest um, way we can do that is to take a vocabulary of words and then put a simple one or zero, depending on whether that though that word appears in uh, the sentence. At the other end of the scale, we have um, so-called word embeddings, where we can sort of derive some kind of semantic me meaning, um, in this case, telling the difference between apple as a fruit and apple as um, a type of telephone. What we have here is a numerical representation in some massive 300-dimensional uh, space that we can't imagine. Um, and it's all derived by lots and lots of data. and the, um, where, it sit, where it sits in that space is entirely dependent on what data we've given the algorithm that works it out. We then come to modeling the language. We can start off um, again being very um, naive and assuming that the appearance of a word in a sentence has absolutely nothing to do with the um, other words in the sentence. Or we could say that the word is just dependent on whatever came before, the word that came before it. So spoon, soup is more likely to be followed by spoon than knife or fork. Um, recurrent uh, neural networks, which are, um, have been sort of dominating uh, text NLP for the past uh, decade, are able to take much bigger sentences and look for relationships and a longer string of words. And now in the past year or two, we've had transformers, which can now find relationships in words across a whole document. Um, but each of these requires more and more text, more data to get in to, to learn all these really complex relationships. The important thing is that my, the language model has never looked at, touched, or even eaten with a spoon. Um, it has no idea. It's just taking new numbers in and spitting numbers out again. Um, all the way back in 1980, John Searle was saying that computers know absolutely nothing. And he's been having to defend that point for 40 years. Um, but here we see it uh, just last year talking about um, neural net network models, even the most complex ones, have no concept of meaning. They just reflect meaning in a linguistic form, which is very useful to us. Um, to get the best out of, out of AI and machine learning, it's all about the data. We've heard a lot about bias this morning and getting the right data in to get the right results. The problem I see with that is as we use more complex knowledge, uh, models, we need more and more data. But the reason we're turning to AI in the in the first place is because we can't label our data in the first place <laughs> but in, with our current methods. So I think there's a kind of catch-22 situation there. Fortunately, the um, machine learning um, uh, community are also having the same problems and looking actually towards archivists. Um, Joe and Gebru were talking about how archival scholars already have the language and procedures to address and discuss many of the challenges that they are currently experiencing. Um, and I'm going to pass back to Jenny. Thanks, Mark. So this is just a quick conclusion. We're sort of saying that um, you really do need to think about what you're actually doing because AI is, is like snake oil. It really is at the moment. So when you're considering AI and archives, just think about what exact processing is being done by the humans, what exact processing is being done by the machines. And, and perhaps don't fall into the trap of assuming that that, that processing is analogous in any way. I, I would argue that a lot of what we're doing is simply data derivation and distillation. 
Um, and if the data from which you're drawing your inferences has been derived in this way, it has been derived for you by some form of what you would like to see as just pre-processing, be that by a human archivist or an information technology or a machine classifier, you are creating a blind spot for yourself and, 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 and you are not undertaking proper source criticism. So you must look into that blind spot even if it coincides with one of your least favorite kind of areas of voluntary incompetence, which in my case is statistics. So you can see why I struggle with AI. So that's it, thank you very much. And hand over to David, I think.